end of last week, we got a kind of a shock report showing that U.S. GDP had actually gone backwards. Um, that was not something that economists were expecting. So joining us to break down what exactly is going on with that and also with our economy writ large is Professor Richard Wolf. He is host of Economic Update, professor of economics emeritus at UMass Amherst, visiting professor at the New School, and also founder of Democracy at Work. It is always a pleasure to see you, sir. Good to see you, sir. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, our pleasure. So go ahead and put this report uh, from the Wall Street Journal up on the screen Screen there. You see U.S. GDP falls 1.4% as economy shrinks for the first time since early in the pandemic. Um, Professor, what did you make of this report? Well, you know, the first reaction I had is that it's the latest in a number of statistics where the reaction should be We saw this coming. We knew it would happen. It really wasn't a question of whether. It was mostly a question of when and when just arrived. Let me explain what I mean. We've been suffering a serious inflation for a year now. And there's an effort all over the place to minimize it, deny it, explain it away, excuse it, make it temporary. It isn't. It's a very serious problem in this society, as has been the inflation long before a year ago, but an inflation that was restricted to the stock market where prices zoomed and hadn't yet come to the daily uh, economy we all live in. Now we see a shift. That inflation, which was with the stock market, and wealthy people loved it, now has moved to hit the mass of the people. And if it prices go up, and we're guessing these days 9 10% as a fair notion of what's really happening, we know without being needing rocket science that people can't afford to buy goods and services rising in price this way. Never could, but after two years of the worst public health disaster in our society and the second worst economic crash, both happening at the same time, an inflation is going to have a magnified effect. And what that means is with less goods and services that people can afford to buy, less get produced, uh, among other things, and you get the shrinkage of our economy that quote unquote shocks everybody, but really shouldn't have. So, Professor, can you talk a little bit about that phenomenon in the context of the Fed? We were talking about earlier in the show about the Fed uh, possibly have allowing both a passive runoff of bonds, but also tightening interest rates, which could trigger, you know, slowing down the economy. What does that look like in the context of the current inflation? What does that mean in the future? Well, two things. And, and they're not quite compatible, but that's the way our, our crazy economy works. On the one hand, there's a serious question of whether the Federal Reserve is even able to stop this uh, inflation. Mm-hmm. You know, they were trying to avoid one before. That didn't work. They were trying to avoid the three, count them, three economic crashes we've had in this new century. Dot com in 2000, the subprime mortgage in 2008, and now this one associated with the COVID, uh, their record is poor. So the first big question is, will the interest rate increases scheduled for this month, if not this week, will those in fact be adequate, will be effective in slowing the inflation? That's a big open question mark. But the second point, let's assume for the moment that they work, that either on their own, if he, if they raise it a half a percentage point, or with more later this year, as they have said they will do, in that event, here's what it means. You're making all kinds of things more expensive in this society when you raise interest rates more expensive to take out a mortgage for your home, more expensive to make those monthly payments for your car, more expensive to make the monthly payments on your credit debt, and possibly even affecting the student debt uh, in this country, which is now an enormous uh, phenomena. That's all going to have negative effects on people's lives. And here's what that means. COVID, a crash that more than half the American people were unemployed uh, in 2020 and or 2021 for 
weeks or months at a time, then an inflation, and now a recession brought on by rising interest rates. You know, the Deutsche Bank, which has no uh, skin in this game because it's in Germany, uh, they've already predicted a recession here, and they're advising their clients to adjust their investments in the United States on that assumption. They will be hurt if they've made a mistake. But it should give you an idea that for most of us, we are watching a series of attacks on the mass of people's standard of living that will also, in my judgment, lead to real serious social changes and unrest in this country, which in the case of the labor movement, you are already seeing. Yeah, I completely agree. Could you lay that on a little bit more? How do you... um how do you connect the, you know, what we do see happening with the labor movement and votes are being counted today in uh, the Amazon Labor Union's second union election there on Staten Island? Why are we seeing those uh, bubblings up there, Starbucks, other places across the country with the economic landscape as it is today? Well, I'm going to give you an answer, and I admit before I even do that it comes from me as a professor. I've been that all my life. I'm close to the academic world. I'm part of it. And let me point out to something that may have escaped your attention. I don't know whether you covered this already. There was a remarkable effort at Grinnell College in Iowa on the part of students at the college who happen also to be hourly workers. Mm -hmm. More and more in the United States, students are called upon to do labor, partly because they're desperately financially strapped, taking out loans they can't afford, squeezing their parents in ways that are difficult for them. We, we all know that story. And by the way, it's a cheap labor force uh, for the college. So it's unusual that the students would mobilize to, to unionize. They did. They made a real effort. Uh, these undergraduates, it's what they are, Grinnell College is, is an undergraduate college, well-known, well-respected college. They voted, finally, they were strong enough, they got an agreement from the college to remain quote-unquote neutral. They had their vote last week, and the vote was, if I have the numbers right, and I know I'm close, 327 in favor of unionization, six against. Wow. More important than the fact that they won a union, which is very important, is the fact that they won it on such a lopsided uh, outcome. And I think what you're seeing, and this is just, you know, the tip of the iceberg, what you're seeing is a whole generation that has absorbed these hits, there's no other word to say it, hits to the working class, the middle class of this country. They're seeing it in their parents. They're seeing it in their strained school finances. They're seeing it in the quality of the jobs their, their seniors, graduating seniors for the last two or three years have been able to get. The number of them that are looking forward to being a barista in a coffee shop or driving an Uber car or whatever it is they end up doing, that they're they're living out the constriction of the American dream. It's being pulled away from them, and it's very painful for them to see the implicit promises made to them by the school, by their parents, by the society as a whole, shrinking out of view, out of their grasp. They are upset. And they're beginning to think through that maybe mobilization in a labor movement is some kind of way forward when there look to be no other ways. And for those of us that have studied the unionization drive of the 1930s, that's what happened then. The Great Depression had to be in place from 1929 to 1932 before people began to realize oh goodness, we better join a union that may make this bad time a little less bad than it would otherwise have been. Something like that is underway now. Hmm. 
It has been extraordinary to watch, and I know there are a couple of other colleges that are moving in that same direction. Yes. What made it so unique is that this was, you know, not just one sector of the sort of student labor economy, but the entire college in such overwhelming numbers. Um, Professor Wolf, it's always so great to see you. Thank you so much for making things clear. Thanks for joining us, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Uh, look, your guys' support just means the world. You know, we were talking in that CNN block just about the incentives of cable news. It just reminds me how lucky we are to do the show, Crystal. You know, we program it exactly the way that we want, what yep. we think will be best in order to make people feel as if they're getting the best amount of information possible, highlighting the stories that aren't being covered. So you're the ones who make that possible. And we got some big stuff uh, in the works, which I'm really, really excited in order to debut as we approach our one-year anniversary. Thank you all so much for watching, and we will see you all tomorrow. Have a good one, guys. See you back here tomorrow. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.